Thank you. I just want to thank everybody for joining us again for another um, Lunch and Learn. Um, my name is Jen Walling. I'm the Executive Director of the Illinois Environmental Council, and I am really pleased today to have David McGillis, um, who is the Government Affairs Representative at Environmental Law and Policy Center, um, also presenting with us. Um, is this our third year in a row, David, presenting together? When did I bring you into this mess? Maybe 2017, so maybe Ooh. this is... Oh, this is fourth year in a row. All right, well, we're recording it and we have the slides available. Um, so uh, we can do the, uh, share this with whoever. Um, and I'm really pleased, you know, we've got 55 people on today. Um, there's over a thousand people that we've trained through this program. Um, and we're just really proud of um, what we've done to make sure that people have the knowledge about how Springfields works and they can access it. But definitely we'll have our contact info at the end. And if there's anything that you need, um, we are here for you. But I wanna tell you a little bit first about um, the Illinois Environmental Council. Our tagline is building power for people and the environment. Um, and you can see in this next slide, we were founded in 1975. We represent more than 100 environmental organizations and nearly 500 in individual environmentalists throughout Illinois. We'll give you a link if you wanna join. Um, but we are a lobbyist for all of these different organizations, um, sort of a trade association. An Environmental Law and Policy Center, for example, is one of our members. And we look at every single bill that gets introduced and look at its environmental impact and head back and ask our members how we should vote on it. We just uh, spoke this morning on a range of bills that had to do with things like carbon sequestration or uh, hunting, conservation, um, a number of bills that we've introduced. And as we go through this today, we'll talk a little bit about how we expect that the session will be changed a bit um, if there may be allowed some, some remote possibilities. Um, it's definitely an unusual year. So um, we're, we're gonna go into that, but I will let David introduce himself as well. Thank you, Jen. My name is David McEllis. I am government affairs representative for ELPC, the Environmental Law and Policy Center. As Jen said, we are a member organization of the Illinois Environmental Council. And uh, I serve on the Environmental Council's board as the vice president of one of the boards. Where ELPC is a Midwestern based uh, public interest environmental organization. And we operate throughout the Midwest and our headquarters is in Chicago. And we're, we have a team of attorneys, business specialists, policy advocates, and lobbyists and communication specialists working on clean air, clean water, and uh, clean energy and transportation issues. And we also have a DC office as well. Great. Now I'm in charge of the slide. So um, I'm going to start off with the, the very first thing here, which is most important for being able to access Springfield is figuring out who your state legislator is. So we actually start with this because, you know, that is, um, that is the grounding. Um, and uh, knowing who your lawmaker is, is your first step to knowing the Springfield process. Um, it's a really good practice to, on a regular basis, look from top to bottom about all of the lawmakers who represent you. That way you're both prepared for election and you can hold them accountable and track what they're doing in the different legislative bodies. So this is the legislator lookup that is on um, the ILGA.gov website. And again, ILGA.gov, we're gonna reference that website a billion times during this presentation. I'm gonna show you lots of screenshots. I look at it like all day long, um, but you go to the legislator lookup tool, click on this and you can get all of your state elected officials. I will say, and this is, I'll, I'll leave this for the chat, I have yet to find an Illinois resource that adequately combines both your municipal elected officials all the way up to the top in the state and Congress. Um, this tool is only your state lawmakers, your US lawmakers, and then the constitutional officers. And I also will say, you know, um, there's a lot of folks, for example, that will sign up for our lobby day and they'll put their US congressman or US senator down. But so if you think your senator is Dick Durbin, he is your US Senator, but you also have an Illinois State Senator um, that represents you as well. And um, each Senate district has two rep districts. So you have an Illinois House member that is part of it as well. So, um, you know, from, from top to bottom, I have yet to find a resource that has all of the elected officials. So if anybody finds one, share it. But this one does have the state and federal. 
Um, and then you can look up a little more about your lawmaker on their member page. This is Representative Carol Ammons, who's from Champaign. She just happens to be first alphabetically, which is why I have used her bio. Um, in our previous, uh, previous discussion on advocacy, we talked a lot about learning more about your lawmaker and what influences them before going in to talk to them. And actually, um, I don't know, Matt, maybe if you can post the link to the previous YouTube video in the comments, if you want to check out our advocacy training that we did a couple of weeks ago, we go into a little bit more about why it's important to look at this information, look at what committees the person is on, um, read the biography and see what things influence them and get to know your lawmaker because it's an important part of the advocacy process. But this member page is available for everybody. Um, there's Springfield office information, which those Springfield offices are not um, done yet, although we don't know when they'll be in the Springfield offices. So those are the old ones, but they still will receive mail if you send it in. Um, district offices are, are a little better though. Then there's the email, how long that they've been in the office, committee assignments, when those come available will be there. Um, you know, and then they'll have the bills and, and different committees, et cetera, on, on the member page. So this is something you definitely should get to know about your lawmaker and a really good place to ground all of this work. But we're gonna head into this. So I'm gonna give this to David. Thanks, Jen. The agenda for today, we're gonna go through some of the deadlines, Springfield's uh, enforced deadlines for bills, introductions, moving them out of committee and understanding the Springfield schedule. Also understanding your legislator schedule and when it's a good time to contact them and, uh, and, and at what point in the process you're gonna to wanna to contact legislators. We'll also talk about the process of a bill. So everything from drafting to following the progress of that bill and uh, everything from introduction, drafting introduction all the way up to the governor's desk, hopefully. And then we'll talk about points of interaction with your legislator, how to file a witness slip, and Jen will go through how to testify in committee. Great, so I'm gonna do the next few slides here. And I wanna point us first, especially because we're getting a CLE today to the Illinois Constitution. So the Illinois Constitution determines um, a lot of the basic framework of how the General Assembly operates and how we pass bills, how bills become law. For those of you unfamiliar with law at all, um, you know, we're going to talk today, there's the Constitution, the Illinois statutes, a bill is the vehicle that changes a statute. Um, I don't think we really get into rulemaking except just to say that it exists. Um, and rules are the details that are put together by uh, executive agencies to follow the statute. Um, and then, you know, on top of that, there is the federal government with the U.S. Constitution, um, the U.S. Uh, U.S. statutes, etc., and rules that happen at the federal level that um, most of the time supersede what's happening at the state level. So this is the legislature, um, you know, Article 4 of the Constitution is the legislature. Uh, so you can check this out. And there's a couple of things that I have pointed out to in the Constitution that really um, govern the way that the General Assembly operates. So the first one is the passage of bills. Uh, what is different from Illinois than in other legislatures is that the bill may originate in either house but must be maybe amended or rejected by the other. That portion, um, uh, and then no bill shall become law without a concurrence of a majority of the members elected to each house. These portions are what uh, gives Illinois the um, need to, you take a bill, you move it to the second. So if a bill starts in the house, it has to move to the Senate, and then the exact same language has to both pass in both chambers before it can head to the governor. There are some states where you can pass a bill in the House and the Senate with the identical language and different bill numbers, and it can go up to the governor and happen. And actually, you could pass it sometimes in some states with different language, and then there's like a conference like there is with the US government, and then it heads over um, to the executive authority to sign. In Illinois, that is not the case. Um, you know, even if you passed identical language in each chamber, it's got to be brought up. So um, I think that's, you know, that's something that's pretty important to know. Um, and so um, another item that we're going to get to, Section 8, Part D, we're going to refer to this a lot. So I'm going to talk about this part, and then we're going to underline it several times, because it is a part that I find people find difficult to understand. 
Um, under Section 8, Part D, a bill shall be read by title on three different days in each house. So um, this means that the, and, and you see it says title. So um, a bill, like the, the bills that get put forward, like HB 100, um, what will happen with the different readings is there's a first reading. And in the first reading, literally, there's just a clerk that just like, reads it into the record and reads the title. Um, actually, nobody needs to be on the floor even when they get, this gets read, but it does get read out loud. Um, there is a you know, perfunctory session sometimes where they'll just get read, but these do get read out loud orally on the house floor where they will read each title. So that is first reading. Um, second reading, um, similarly, there is no vote, but um, you know, often uh, you do need to be, they do need to be on the House floor when they do second readings or Senate floor. And then the third reading is actually the vote. Um, but so you do need to read the title of the bill on three different days. Um, and so technically the minimum amount of, amount of time that you would need to get a brand new bill from House to Senate to governor would be five days because you would have three days first, second, third reading in the House, and then the third reading can overlap with the first reading in the Senate, and second, third, and then it's on to the governor. That is technically the quickest that you could get a brand new bill through. Um, but we're going to teach you a lot about shell bills and vehicle bills and other things that are used to cut into the process. Because as I've said, you need to read the title on three different days in the, each House. You do not need to read the full text and have this full text available for that amount of time. And so there are a lot of shortcuts that are put in. Um, we're going to refer to it as a lot of magic. Sometimes that magic is used for bad, sometimes it's used for good. So it just really depends um, on it. But this is what the Constitution says, and this is what they need to follow. So the other item here, and we're going to go a little bit into the effective date of laws more. So I'm going to say this this first time, and it's confusing, so we'll go into it a second time. So um, May 31st is an incredibly important deadline because um, if you want a bill to be effective in the calendar year that you're passing it, um, before May 31st, you only need a majority of the members of the General Assembly and afterward you need three fifths. So in the Illinois House, there are 118 members, 60 is a majority, 71 is a super majority, and in the Senate, 30 is a majority, 36 is a supermajority. And so if you want it to happen that calendar year, you need to pass it before May 31st um, with the majority, or if you pass it after May 31st and you want it to come effective that year, you need a supermajority. And so that really governs a lot of this, like especially if you have a tricky budget situation or any bill that's gonna be a problem, you just wanna pass it with the majority and not a supermajority. But that is governed by the Illinois Constitution um, that the, you know, the General Assembly shall provide by law for a uniform effective date for laws passed prior to June 1st, and a bill passed after May 31st shall not become effective prior to June 1st in the next calendar year, unless the General Assembly, by the votes of three-fifths of the members elected to each house, provides for an earlier effective date. So um, this stuff, super important, um, and definitely, uh, definitely related to the Constitution. We're going to go over that uh, thing again. And I'm going to show you this here, which is the process summarized. Um, and we've talked about the third readings. We're going to nail this down. The bill gets introduced in one chamber. It goes to committee. There's a floor vote. Introduced in second chamber, committee. There's a floor vote. Um, if the language uh, is different at all, it has to go to concurrence. Um, and then it goes to the governor. And the governor may sign it and become law, or the governor may veto, mandatorily veto it. Um, Again, this is ILGA.gov. I'm just gonna to talk to you about the different resources that are available there. There are lists of lawmakers, there are schedules. Um, now you can watch every part of the proceeding live um, through audio video at ILGA.gov. There's not a single committee where you cannot at least get audio, which when I first started this job, there were a lot of committees that you could not watch online. So you would have to be there in person. Um, and even further back, you know, this website didn't always exist. So it used to be in the olden days that lobbyists would go to a little corner where there was a bulletin board to figure out what was up and what was filed, go to the journal room, get a copy. Um, 
thankfully we don't have to do that anymore and we can do a lot of things by audio and video um and as things have progressed um you know this year in the lame duck session the house took testimony they did not have any witnesses that were available that were allowed into in person so they did some basically like web-based testimony the senate was still requiring in person we'll talk about that in a little bit and how that'll affect things but those sorts of links will absolutely be online as well um but you can watch all the things and you can watch them online if you get bored so this is uh just a little bit about ilj.gov this is the bottom part we're going to talk about filing witness slips we're going to talk about the administrative rules a little more this has the find your um, lawmaker thing and then there's previous general assemblies, which is something I'm looking at a lot right now because we're we've just changed over to a new general assembly. The general assemblies are two years in length, so we just started a new one, the 102nd general assembly, and all of the bills go away and start over, and we start with new bill, bill numbers as of January 13th of this year. So if you want to go back and look at like CJA from last year, you have to look at previous general assemblies. So um, that is a little bit on the website. I also, um, it's really important to understand the schedule that the General Assembly is using, and the schedule is online. So um, you can look for the House schedule. Uh, this has a list of committee hearings. It has the 102nd General Assembly session schedule. Um, I wouldn't like book, you know, I wouldn't book a bunch of hotel rooms around the session schedule for this year. We really don't know that um, people will have to, will be allowed to go down in terms of lobbying. And in terms of lawmakers, they've already canceled almost all of February. Um, there's just a, a rules vote that may happen on February 10th, um, but the rest of February, there's no session. We really expect it to be moved back. So um, that is a thing to think with all of this, that these committees, these other things can be canceled basically at any time. And we're gonna give you some tips later for how to figure out in advance, like what may happen and how to deal with that. But the schedule is up online. and so. I also will say here, our, um, we do have a part-time legislature, although you know if you talk to a lot of lawmakers, they are working this as a full-time job because there's just so much to do. Um, but from January through May is when they're generally in session and then a couple weeks in October, November for veto session. But there is a scheduling to this um, that is important. Uh, this is just an example of what the calendar looks like. As you can see, none of these days are happening. Um, and then these are important too. These are the deadlines for 2021 um, that need to be followed. So actually today, um, David's gonna talk about the Legislative Reference Bureau, but if you want a new bill drafted, today's the last day for the House. Next week is the last day for the Senate. Um, there's also an introduction deadline for substantive House bills that happens in February. Um, and then there's a, uh, then there are a bunch of things for committees, third reading, et cetera. So um, these are the different deadlines that need to be followed. And the vast majority of bills follow these deadlines um, that are set by rule by uh, each chamber. Um, there's some that don't, but like, I'm gonna say like 95% of bills um, end up following these deadlines. So these are, these are pretty important, especially if you're an advocate trying to get something done. So this is just um, also something that can be posted on the schedule site. This is a good way to figure out where a lawmaker may be during the day um, if you're needing to see them or if you're figuring out your schedule, um, you know, looking at what committees they may be on and, and trying to figure that out. Um, pretty important. So that's what's happening this week. And then I'm passing it off to David, who's going to talk to you about how a bill gets drafted. Thank you. I think this um, normally we start with in example of where bills come from, what kind of bills there are, and, um, and, and really your bill idea could be anything. It could start with an idea written on a napkin, or it could be something that you saw in the New York Times and said, there ought to be a law, or it could be something that exists in another state, or trying to make something statewide that exists at a local level. So, those ideas kind of come from all over the place. Legislators may come up with their own ideas or we as, as lobbyists and advocates may bring them ideas and say, might think about doing something on this topic. So normally I present some kind of um, idea and Jen told me I had to come up with a new one this year because my uh, backpacks on train ban 
was played out and I haven't taken the train in nine months. So I got to come up with a new idea because I'm sitting at home and looking out the window a lot. I see a ton of delivery vehicles and these are clogging up my street. And I see that cars then start honking, then dogs start barking and it's just a real, a real mess. So there's so many delivery vehicles. So my idea is to, um, to limit the number of delivery vehicles on residential streets, particularly mine, but we won't limit it just to mine. Um, and so this idea, you could take this idea to the Legislative Reference Bureau and you could say, I think there's too many vehicles. We need to limit that number. Let's try to limit it to one vehicle, one delivery vehicle per block. So you would take that, that idea and the Legislative Reference Bureau would put that into a bill form you want to draft as much as you can. The Legislative Reference Bureau is a team of attorneys and they're attorneys whose client is um, the person bringing them the piece of legislation. There's attorney client privilege in that too. So if I bring an idea to the Legislative Reference Bureau and say, can you draft up this bill? Jen can't call down and say, I think David brought you this idea and I think it's a bad idea, so you shouldn't do it. There's, there's, or, or, and she can't even really ask them what ideas have been brought to them. So there's that is, um, so Legislative Reference Bureau will draft that language, put it into a format that fits on the ILGA website. Um, and they have a, a specific number for each filed bill and that gets scanned in and becomes the, the piece of legislation uh, as it goes on to the ILGA. So you can, when you're drafting this legislation, you're going to want to look at the compiled statutes to try to figure out where that language might fit in. With my idea of um, this uh, this ban on on delivery vehicles on my street, I might go to the transportation person at, at LRB. There's a specific drafter for every uh, for for different sections of code, and we'll get into that in a little bit. But you'll want to have as much of it drafted as possible before you take it to LRB. Uh, can you go to the next slide, Jen? And here's some information for LRB. There's the phone number. And normally, you should be a registered lobbyist and have a bill sponsor to take your idea uh, to LRB. You can't just say, I have an idea without a bill sponsor who is willing to take that bill and vouch for that bill. You'll want to have uh, an effective date for the bill. So with my bill idea, I would want to make it an immediate effective date, or I might want to give them a little bit of time to figure out Amazon's shipping dynamics, and then they can give them six months or something to figure out how to keep all of these trucks off my street. You can also, you can specify an effective date, or you can say uh, a date that is contingent upon the passage of other bills, or you can leave it totally empty. And so if you leave the effective date off, as Jen was talking about earlier with the May 31st deadline, a bill passed prior to June 1st will take effect January 1st. If it's passed after May 31st, it will take effect June 1st of the following year, if there's no express effective date. And so when you call down to LRB, you wanna have the statute ready so that, uh, or the section of code ready to tell to the person at the front desk and then they can direct you to the, the proper drafter. And, or there's also an email address that you can just send drafting requests to. And today is the deadline for the house. So we've missed that one, but normally we suggest trying to get those bill requests in as early as possible because legislation could take a long time to get drafted. Next slide, please. You're gonna to wanna to have, uh, there's specific parts of a bill that you're that you're going to wanna to have. Uh, and, and these things will show up on ILGA when you look at a piece of legislation. And so it's things like the subject of a bill. So you have, the, the, the subject would be something like uh, an act concerning, in my case, transportation. So this applies to the delivery trucks. So let's say that's an act concerning transportation. It could be something like an act concerning fish or horses. And there's also more general 
topics like regulation. You'll want to have maybe you could have a short title. You don't have to have a short title, but the short title, an example of that could be the Clean Energy Jobs Act. And it, uh, in the bill, it would say this act will be known as the Clean Energy Jobs Act. My short title I came up with was the Truck Restriction and Unnecessary Climate Killing Emissions Act or Truck Act, which I thought was very clever and fun. So from now on, I'm going to refer to it as the Truck Act. And the purpose of this act, you can talk about the public policy that a bill is trying to implement or the uh, or affect. And so in in CJA, you have a lot of this, the purpose of this act and Clean Energy Jobs Act to talk about the growth of the green economy and, uh, and impacting environmental justice communities. And you, you can put a lot of more narrative language in into the purpose and legislative intent. You're gonna to wanna to have definitions. So for the truck act, I'm gonna to want to define what a delivery vehicle is. Do I want to exclude certain vehicles? You might want to exclude US Postal Service because I probably don't wanna get into a fight with them. Do I want to limit it to only trucks of a certain blue color? Do I wanna say that brown trucks are okay? So in the definition, you can define certain acts. I could define what roads are applicable for the purposes of this act. And then you get into the main provisions of this act, of the act. This is kind of the, the meat of a bill, which, or the protein of a bill, sorry. Um, and in my case, I think I would just say that you would use the above definitions to spell out what the law does. So no more than one delivery truck on a street at a given time within a one block range. That could be the entirety of, of my act because all the definitions limit down that, that main point of the bill. And then you're gonna, you could have penalties. So would we, this be a ticketable offense or a business offense, civil or criminal <laughs> offense here? And then there's clauses like a severability or inseverability clause in the, my truck act case, I'm not sure that this would apply, but uh, in an example of this, in the future energy jobs act passed in 2016, there was a severability clause. And what that means is if a court challenges the law and one portion of the law is found to be unconstitutional, the rest of the bill is still maintained even if that one portion is struck. An inseverability clause does just the opposite. So if you say that this bill is not severable, if one portion of that bill is challenged in court and struck, the entire bill is unconstitutional. In the case of the Future Energy Jobs Act, there was a severability clause. So when the court challenged the uh, nuclear provisions of that, uh, or when, a, when the nuclear provisions of that bill were challenged, if they had been deemed unconstitutional, the rest of the bill would have stood and the renewable portions and energy efficiency portions would have been maintained. And you'll, you can have a repeal date, which could be a set date in the future for a bill to go away. So do, you could say in five years, so June 1st of 2026, this bill is no longer operable and the bill just goes away. Then you could also have the an effective date. You would want to put the effective date, which I already discussed. So it could be immediate or at a point in the future. And next, please. So now we're going to talk about how to read and write a bill. So when we're looking at a, a, a bill on ILGA, a new act, so my truck act would probably would be not underlined. It would all be just regular, regular font. If you were editing a, and amending an existing act, let's say that there was already, in, if I wanted to add this into an existing vehicle registration uh, portion of the Illinois compiled statutes, I would add it as underlined text. So it would be amending an existing act. If I wanted to just, let's say this bill passes and it has a one year expiration date 
and I want to get rid of that, you would just strike through that old that text. And so that's how you tell the difference. That's when you're writing up a bill, you want it to look like this for LRB so that it makes it easier for them to put it into the format of ILGA. And next. And so this is an example of new text. This was, I think, findings from the Future Energy Jobs Act. This is this one, CJ. Or Clean Energy Jobs Act. And there we go. So as we talked about with parts of a bill, this is the findings. You have a more narrative and uh, flowery language than most legislation talking about uh, growing the clean energy economy. And then next for strike through and underline language. And this, I think, was just a cleanup, some kind of cleanup where they just changed uh, a numbered section from a bill to say this section. But you can see there that this section replaces the old numbered section. Some of the common environmental statutes that and energy statutes that we amend or have drafted are the utilities section, public health, environmental safety, ag, and conservation. When contacting LRB, you would use one of those numbers and say, you know, I need to have something drafted in section 415. And then the person at the front desk would direct you to the proper drafter of that section of code. And moving on to shell bills, Jan mentions shell bills. Sometimes there are hundreds of these that are passed out of committee on a single day. And it seems like this, this is one of those magical things in Springfield that sometimes when you're explaining it, it seems like magic or it seems sketchy. And it doesn't necessarily, it, it's not necessarily magic, it's more of or sketchy. It's one of those things that are is done for constitutional requirements. The uh, as there are certain reading deadline days, sometimes you get past a reading deadline day and your bill has not moved out of committee. And so you need to amend a different bill to get around or to work within the constitutional requirements of those. Uh, those deadlines. And these shell bills are just exactly that. They're a shell of that includes nothing inside. In this case, you can see the, the full language of the bill here is that it strikes the word and and replaces it with the word and. So if this bill were to pass as is, it would do nothing. And so the it's important to note with the shell bills what type of bill it is, the short title of a bill. You, This one, I believe, was an act concerning civil law. So any uh, amendment attached to that would have to be something dealing with civil law. We couldn't attach something, let's say, dealing with energy to an act concerning fish uh, because it, it wouldn't fit into, into that category. So those, uh, it's important to note what, what kind of bill it is. And, you know, some of those are more general, like an act concerning regulation can be pretty much anything. Uh, this, this isn't always a sketchy thing, as I said. I think Jen might have an example of, um, uh, to, to share on one of these. Yeah, go for it. It's story time here. Um, you know, I know that we look at some of these and there are things where shell bills are used for very sketchy things that are moved at the last second. But, you know, we talked about the constitutional um, requirement that a bill titles are at three times and then we have these deadlines. I'll tell you the story in um, 2013, we were the first state in the nation to ban plastic microbeads from personal care products. And when we passed it, we used a shell bill because I actually had put in a shell bill that like changed the word and from and because there was actually um, just in very on brand for Jen, there was a composting bill that I was considering putting in that year that was in the EPA Act. And I had given a lawmaker a shell bill because we weren't quite done with the language at the time that it had been put forward. Um, but we ended up not pursuing that composting language 
And Alliance for the Great Lakes brought me this language about uh, microbeads and personal care products um, in March. And you'll notice that is the deadline that is, it was right before committee deadline, like a few days before. And it was after bill introduction, after writing something from LRB. So we went in and got an amendment and we used a shell bill that I had previously put in to move forward the uh, microbeads ban. So, you know, some of these just preserve options for later on that can be really important. Um, I think when you get into something sketchy, it's where a bill is moved forward without um, a whole lot of review. Like there, it's not out there for a while, it's passed. You know, I have seen like, especially like a hospital assessment bill, I have seen that passed in less than 24 hours from when the language was put in until the point at which it got through both chambers. And it did, um, because it was a bill uh, that was on concurrence, it did at least need a day between each, but that is the fastest I've ever seen a bill with brand new language passed. Um, and you know that's where it's sketchy because there's a lack of transparency, there's a lack of review beforehand. But sometimes shell bills are used to preserve options um, for this. And so I just advanced slide accidentally and we're on to vehicle bill. So you should talk about this, David, and then I'll tell a story about what this is. Of course. And yeah, as Jen said, you know, some of those some shell bills are used for things that have been negotiated for a year and they sit there the shell sits as an option to be used and leadership can uh, leadership in the house or senate can give that shell bill to a member and say well you've been working on that for a long time so attach that to this regulation shell bill and uh, and yes in other cases it's not as clear cut uh, this is a vehicle bill which is slightly different it's a bill that at one point did something unlike a shell but was entirely replaced by an amendment in this case this uh, started as a trucking regulation bill weight uh, an act concerning weights and measures and this bill moved from one chamber from the senate over to the house in the 98th general assembly so probably 2013 or so and it moved and would have been an operative bill dealing with something like, um, I think was it farm trucking, Jen, something like that. And in the house, it was then amended to become the fracking bill. Mm -hmm. And so this bill was properly positioned like with that, with that timing issue. Sometimes if a bill is in the second chamber, if it's already passed out of the house, and um, or out of the Senate and over to the House, then it can move very quickly once amended because it just has to go back to the first chamber for concurrence. Um, this could have been a duplicate bill where a bill is introduced in the House and the Senate. And sometimes those bills pass maybe even on the same day out of both chambers. And there's an agreement that whichever bill shows up in the second chamber first will be the the bill that it goes to the governor. So what happens to that other duplicate bill? It becomes a shell and is properly positioned to become something else. And um, Jen, in this case, uh, do you want to add your story on to this one? Uh, you told my story for me. So Did I tell fracking. your story? I'm sorry. So the, this the bill be no, became the fracking bill, which had long been debated and uh, you see, we've done this too many times. I know your stories. Um, <laughs> and uh, this bill had already gone through one chamber. The fracking uh, regulations and had or the, the fracking language had already been well debated and uh, figured out behind the scenes and then was attached onto this bill and passed back to the Senate. Cool. And so that's a, a vehicle bill, which is becomes a shell. Using ILGA to search for a bill, the, as Jen said, the ILGA website, it's not the prettiest website, but it is very effective. And if you know how to use it, it, is, um, it, it has a, a lot of very good information on there. The easiest way to find a bill is to search for a bill number. And you just type it in the search bar and the bill will come up. However, as Jen just said, it's a new General Assembly, so there's all new bill numbers for us to remember. Senate Bill 1 from last year is now something entirely different. And so it's gonna take a little bit of time for us to remember all those new bill numbers. 
If you know the sponsor, you can click on that sponsor's page and go to the bills page of their member page and you can see all of their bills. You can see either bills that they have sponsored or co-sponsored. And clicking uh, to see all the bills from just that sponsor will remove all of those that are co-sponsors or that they're co-sponsors on. If you don't know the sponsor or the bill number, you can use the search function. It's not like Google. It is not a super smart search engine. <laughs> um, but if you know something very specific about a bill, like it deals, it's called the Truck Act, you could search for that. Or if you knew that it dealt with the words delivery trucks, you could put that in quotes and search for it. If you're searching for something like criminal law, you're going to come up with thousands of, of results. Um, but if you have something, the more specific, the better. But it's it's not the greatest, but there's you can find some things on that page. Well, and I'll add, when you're searching for a bill by keyword, I'm going to go back to it, um, it doesn't just show you places where the law has been edited, where it's new. It shows you places where it's existing law. So if you know, you're looking up, I don't know, I'm obsessed with this. If you're looking up the word compost, it's not going to just show you the new bills that I have introduced because I'm the only one putting them in on composting. It's going to show you um, bills from bills that show you existing law. So anything that might be about a pollution control facility will show up in the search. So it's very hard to use. Um, I often will use Lexus or other things. We use other tracking tools for it. Um, trying to pick the most unique search term is, is about the only way to do it. Once you found that bill number that you're looking for, this is the page that comes up. So you, and you can click on the full text of the bill that, and that will give you both the introduced version of the legislation, as well as any amendments that have been added on longer bills like the clean energy jobs act they will make you look at a pdf rather than just displaying it on that page and um, amendments you have to make sure that you're looking at the most recent amendment and that you know which amendments are applicable let's say a bill was passed out of the house over to the senate with an amendment it will show up as the enrolled version of that bill and that will have all of the amendments attached to it. If the bill has not yet passed, you will have to figure out which of the amendments applies to the language that was introduced. An amendment could replace everything in the bill or it could just replace pages and lines of, of text. So it's important to figure out which amendments are, are applicable. And it won't show up as a whole bill until it passes out of one chamber or the other. And you can also look at votes here, which will show you all of the votes uh, from committee and floor votes. And you can see house sponsors here. We have, this is a, a bill that uh, prevented counties and municipalities from classifying milkweed as noxious or exotic weed. And this was sponsored by Representative Anna Moeller. And there's a hyphen there that is a chief co-sponsor, former Representative Alan Skillicorn was a chief co-sponsor. And we'll get into that a little bit more later, but this also shows the current status of a bill. At this point, it had been assigned to committee, but it had not passed out of committee. I think this is my set, right? And rules committee. I don't remember if this one is you or me. Let's check. Um, I think this one is still me for a couple of them. Yeah. So the this so we often hear about the rules or assignments committee. Rules committee is and assignments are the once a bill is filed in the house, it will go to rules committee. In the Senate, it will go to assignments committee. Both of those committees are made up of five legislators and they meet in relative secret and they assign bills to different committees where they will be substantive committees where they will be heard. So in that rules committee, the legislators will sit and say, and oftentimes this is the, the list of bills is decided beforehand of where things will go. 
And let's say Senate Bill 100, the Rules Committee will vote to send that bill to House Environment and Energy and Environment Committee or House Revenue Committee. And uh, it's the first place that a bill starts. It's also a way that leadership can control which bills move and which bills pass. And for that reason, it's, uh, it's often a scary, <laughs> viewed as kind of a scary thing that if, if a bill is stuck in rules committee, that means it's never going to pass. But all bills uh, start immediately after being filed in rules or assignments committee. Jen, anything to add there? Nope, just, you know, like David Miguel said that these meet a relative secret. So, you know, if you're someone I don't like, I may tell you to go lobby the rules committee or figure out where they're meeting because it's not possible. So not that I don't like, I like everybody, but you know, if I wanted to throw an opponent off their, their track, that is what I would tell them. Um, so yes, unlike a, a committee, a substantive committee where there is debate and you can go testify the rules and assignments committee are not like that. You know, there's not a public participation process. This is the messier, more official, I guess, version of what Jen showed earlier with the path of a bill. And this is from the legislative reference unit. And it shows everything from the bill, starting with the bill drafted at LRB, and we're going to walk through not all of this, but most of this. And, and it ends on the governor's desk. And earlier I said something about the effective date of bills. Um, immediate effective date means immediately upon the governor signing the bill, it goes into effect. And so, yeah, this is the I'm just a bill Illinois version. So we're gonna walk through one of these bills. This is the story of a bill starting in the Senate filed in 2014 on Valentine's Day by now Senate President Don Harmon. And this, this is, bill this first- This is a bill about food cooperatives. Food cooperatives. And this bill started in assignments. Why did this bill go to Judiciary Committee, Jen? Um, it's, uh, it was a change to the cooperative law, which is a business statute. And so it went to judiciary because they oversee the, um, laws that, uh, oversee businesses such as cooperative corporations. Excellent. Thank you. And so this bill had its first reading the day that it was filed on Valentine's day. It was then referred to assignments committee. Assignments Committee a few weeks later assigned the bill to Judiciary Committee. And two weeks after that, the bill passed from Judiciary Committee, nine to zero. After that committee hearing ended, the bill moves back to the floor and is placed on the calendar of second reading. So then it had its second reading on March 27th, after picking up a co-sponsor, now Treasurer Mike Frerix. And then on the 27th, it went to the calendar of third reading. We see an amendment was filed and that amendment was referred to assignments and a new co-sponsor was added on. But then the bill went to third reading and passed 55 to zero and that amendment was not added. So because that amendment was not sent to committee, an amendment has to also go through the committee process. Uh, because it was not passed out of the committee, it was not added onto the bill, was not attached to the bill, and that language is tabled. After passing through the Senate, the bill arrives in the House. And the chief sponsor in the House is now ex- Representative Barb Wheeler. And it looks like she must have pre-filed for that bill. So Jen probably knew in advance that she wanted Representative Wheeler to have this bill. The House representative can then, um, or the House member can pre-file for a bill so that as soon as it comes over, they are the sponsor. This can also be used to adversely, hostily sponsor a bill to try to slow it down. But in this case, the, the right sponsor picked up this bill. 
Again, that bill goes to rules committee in the house, added on another chief co-sponsor, assigned to house judiciary committee. An amendment was added on. That amendment actually did go to judiciary committee and was adopted. Another chief co-sponsor, Republican Rep. Mike Tryon, now IEC board member Mike Tryon, was a chief co-sponsor. And the bill passed out of committee as amended 15 to zero. Went back to the House for a second reading on May 13th. Jen kept picking up some co-sponsors here, Kelly Cassidy, Ron Sandek. So you have a bipartisan sponsored bill here and it went to third reading and passed 112 to zero. But there's another step in this process. It doesn't go straight to the governor yet. It has to go because it was amended in the house. As Jen earlier suggested, it has to go back to the Senate for concurrence. And the, the Senate has to concur on House Amendment 1. So on May 23rd, it was placed on order of concurrence. And then the sponsoring senator has to file a motion to concur. It has to go back to this uh, the same committee that it was heard in, or it has to go to committee. And this one went to committee, passed again out of judiciary 10 to nothing on May 28th. So this is getting right up against the May 31st deadline. Doesn't seem that it would be a problem here because it passed unanimously, but the bill passed 57 to zero. Now it has passed both houses, is sent to the governor and the governor approved it two months later. So the governor has 60 days to approve a, a piece of legislation. And he waited right up until that last 60th day and he signed the bill. It had an immediate effective date, so it became effective on August 26th and is now Public Act 98-1122. Hooray. And this is a not the same bill, though, I don't think. This is, a, this is a different bill, but it shows what the board would look like. And this is, a, I think, for the purposes of what we were just talking about with the chief co-sponsors and co-sponsors. What we have here is a house bill that was sponsored by Mike Tryon and the hyphenated chief co-sponsors are Naomi Jacobson, Kelly Cassidy, Representative Williams and Representative Mike Fortner. So in this case, you have a bipartisan bill. And I think it's important for us to point this out that sometimes legislators are sitting on the house floor. They have an analysis in front of them but you might also just look up at the board and see, oh, this bill has five chief co-sponsors are on it and they're my friends, we're on the same side of the aisle. It's a bipartisan bill. I can ask my seatmate what they think of it. And that's helpful for the purposes of, um, of passing bipartisan legislation. And these are some examples of bills throughout uh, at different points in the process and what they look like on ILGA.gov. This is a bill that has just been filed. So on the first day it's filed, it is referred to rules committee. This is a bill that has just been assigned to committee. This I think is that pollinator or that um, milkweed bill again, it has been assigned to environment committee and picks up a chief co-sponsor. And this is a list of co-sponsors. This is the original, uh, the original clean jobs bill from 2015. And you can see there the hyphenated co-sponsors on this. You have uh, Senate President Harmon, leader Dave Kaler and leader Collins as hyphenated co-sponsors. I think we picked up more chief co-sponsors at some point, but then everything after the, the hyphenated chief co-sponsors are co-sponsors who are just, are, their names don't show up on the board. Cool. 
So I think this is the point where I start telling my stories. Yeah. Um, since we're on slide 36 and thanks for being with us for this full hour. I hope if you guys have questions, you're saving them. Um, you can put them in the chat at any time, but we're also, uh, we'll address all of them at the end. Um, and one of my favorite parts of this presentation, especially since we've been doing it for so many years, is like collecting stories of weird things that happen to bills. Um, and also like, it's been kind of a trip to go through uh, some of these that I have saved from 2014, um, you know, of all of the lawmakers who are no longer with us uh, in the General Assembly. So uh, it's kind of a trip, but I've saved a couple of things because, you know, David showed you that chart of how a bill becomes a law that LRU put together that is like, um, like the craziest family tree ever in terms of um, what a bill actually looks like in its passage. And there are all sorts of crazy things that can happen. And like every year, I feel like I see something that I've never seen before. So this bill in 2014 um, is showing you that a bill can just skip committee. It doesn't need to go to committee. Um, there is a rule that needs to be, um, you, you need to uh, uh, have the, the floor vote on a rule to move it out of there. Um, but this was a bill on bobcat hunting. This was a bill that um, we had opposed uh, to the nail. It um, passed the House and Senate very narrowly, was vetoed by Governor Quinn, came up the next year, um, and this is this is actually where it was vetoed by Governor Quinn. Um, and then it came up the next year uh, and was passed and Governor Rauner signed it. So um, always something I've been pretty pissed about. But this was something that pissed me off a lot because this was in 2014. Um, it was moved forward. There had been committee hearings on in the past, but uh, the rule was the, the rule committee uh, voted to have it skip committee and just go directly to the floor. So that is something that can happen, um, but rarely. And then uh, this is something where there was a vote to an adopt amendment on the floor. Um, this was actually for the, um, uh, there was a fracking ban that was considered when all of the fracking regulation was being considered in 2013. Senator Harmon um, filed, uh, now President Harmon filed an amendment um, to a shell bill to try to get fracking banned in the state. Um, and there was a vote on the floor, which rarely happens. Sometimes there are amendments added on the floor. It is rare, um, but this was a time that there was an amendment added. And um, you know, you look at Senate floor amendment number one, it was 28 to 24. Uh, you know, one of the things we realized at that time when that vote happened, you don't need um, 30 votes to get an amendment adopted on the floor. Um, and so, you know, that was that was important. But we also realized we did not have enough votes because even those 28 people were not all going to vote for the fracking ban. So um, this is just an example of the rules being bent. Um, another story that I want to tell uh, is one, um, and, and Cynthia, actually, I'll just deal with this. If a, if a bill, the bill title always gets read three times. You cannot skip that constitutionally. If you did it, you would be challenged in court. So. Um, here is a bill heard after midnight on May 31st. Um, and this is just an example that the three fifths vote matters. There are stories about the clock being stopped and um, uh, items proceeding past midnight on a particular day. I have never seen that happen in a decade where the clock stops. Um, there's too much where it would be challenged in court if anybody tried to do that. Um, and so I've, I've not seen that done. And if it was done, um, it probably would be done on something that, um, you know, really wouldn't even need that challenge. There's just so much where um, anybody who tried to do that would go directly to court. But bills heard after May 31st need a three-fifths vote. And I want to tell you a story to illustrate that. In 2012, we worked really, really hard to pass a funding solution to help the Department of Natural Resources have more money. Um, the state parks were at risk of closure. There just was not enough money for conservation um, at the Illinois Department of Resources, Natural Resources. So bills heard after midnight on May 31st in the three-fifth vote. Um, we were working so hard and um, we had this, uh, the bill was going to committee. You can see 531, 2012, um, the bill actually headed to financial institutions. Um, and you know the bill was moving as, as far as it passed the house that afternoon. Um, it was supposed to be heard in committee, but then the committee didn't get heard until 11 p.m. And it was heard at the same time as a very controversial bill on foreclosures. 
And there's not really filibustering that happens in the legislature, but Republicans on that committee were able to get the debate extended in that particular committee. And so we're sitting there watching, watching, and it goes past midnight, and now we need three-fifths vote. Well, we knew we had 33 or 34 votes for sure. Um, but after midnight on 6-1-2012, we needed 36 votes. So you can see here where we went to call it, and we called it at about 2 in the morning and only got 33 votes. We worked really hard. Actually, there were bills called just to have debates so we could try to pull some people on. Could not get to 36 votes. So this was moved and it was heard during veto session. And it ended up getting 39 votes in the end after an election because it was an increase in people's vehicle plates. So, um, you know, really concerning. Um, but the bill was heard after midnight on May 31st. Um, and that's just to illustrate that that matters in terms of the three fifths vote. This one is David, um, who's going to talk about just for all of you legal folks. Um, a lawsuit that was uh, moved forward about that same thing. Yes, this was Springfield Right to Life versus Felicia Norwood. Felicia Norwood was Director of Health and Human Services under Governor Rauner. And this, uh, this court case dealt with House Bill 40, which House Bill 40 was a bill that allowed some public funds to be used for abortion services. And it also removed trigger language that would have outlawed Roe versus Wade if the Supreme Court, or would have outlawed abortion if the Supreme Court overturned Roe versus Wade. The substance of the bill is less uh, important to our, our topic here than the weird, um, situation that this that that occurred that was kind of a legislative uh, motion to hold the bill. So there was no effective date on this on this legislation. It passed the House on April 25th, 2017, and then on May 10th passed the Senate. Uh, Senator Harmon filed a motion to reconsider and a motion to reconsider is sometimes used to prevent the clock from starting uh, on that on the time to send a bill to the governor. So you have to send the bill to the governor within 30 days. Senator Harmon filed this motion to reconsider and then the Senate did not have to send the bill to the governor because it was unclear whether Governor Rauner was actually going to sign the bill. And when it became more clear that of what Rauner's intentions were with the bill, a, the motion to reconsider was withdrawn and the bill was sent to the governor. And Rauner signed the bill on September 28th. One of the questions that the court was faced with was when is the effective date of this bill? And the law was challenged for multiple reasons, but one of them was this effective date question. And the issue that was raised was that the legislature acted after May 31st in sending the bill to the governor. And so therefore, this bill should not be effective until June 1st of the following year. And if it had been sent to gov the governor before May 31st and the legislature acted before May 31st, the, it would be effective on January 1st of the next year. The decision of the court was that the final legislative act was on May 10th. And so therefore the bill became law on January 1st of the following year. That's just an interesting, an interesting recent case dealing with the May 31st deadline and effective dates of laws. Cool. All right. So is this me, David, committee hearing? Yes. Okay, cool. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, committee hearings and how to testify in committee hearings, but David is going to talk about witness slips. So um, these are some video or some pictures of committee hearings. Although actually, like I say that, but like the bottom one on the left is actually the Green Caucus meeting, but that is a uh, Stratton 403, a committee hearing room in the Stratton building. And then over to the right is the Senate meeting in room 212. 
Um, and there's different um, rooms where each of the chambers meets um, in committee. Um, and so uh, 212 happens to be Senate most of the time. And there's, there's a lot uh, in the Stratton building, which is across the street. And so um, committee hearings are, from a policy perspective, where um, bills go that are technically legislators that are supposed to be like specializing in the review of a particular type of law. And so um, there are, are a number of different committees and you know they're chaired by different people that have some seniority. And when the bill, um, and usually like bills in particular chapters get assigned to different committees. So if it's in the EPA Act, it's probably going to the Environment and Energy Committee to Ann Williams or the Senate Environment Committee with Melinda Bush in the Senate. Um, there's also an Agriculture and Conservation Committee uh, there's a Judiciary Committee, all these sorts of things, and usually they go there. There's sometimes where, you know, rarely um, a committee, it'll get assigned to a different committee for the purposes of moving or killing a bill, um, but I have rarely seen that, um, you know, and rarely been able to get that either, because there are definitely times I'd like to see my committees go, uh, my bills go to a more favorable committee. So I'm going to hand this to David, because the, the point that I want to make, though, about the committees is when you go into a committee, even now, what they'll do is they will um, convene the committee and they'll sort of like introduce the bill and then they'll say, I need to read the witness slips into the record. One of the things now that it is interesting is that sometimes there are too many witness slips to read, especially when there's an activism campaign and they will ask the committee if they can waive reading the witness slips into the record and that always happens. Um, and so they get put into the record, but they are not read out loud. And so that's why sometimes um, on some bills, we will ask the whole world to file a slip, like we did a lot on an Endangered Species Act. But on some bills, like it's better if there's just a few people that put their name in. So if the Illinois Environmental Council and the Farm Bureau both oppose a bill, we would want the world to know that. And so there may be fewer people that file it and then they will read our names out loud. So they'll say Jen Walling, Illinois Environmental Council, David McGillis, Environmental Law and Policy Center. And that's how committees start. And that's why these are important. Um, this is just a few years ago, they started to do them all online and it really gives anybody access. Um, I'll just, from a legal perspective, David's gonna get into this, um, but like I would also be cautious in filling out your representation part um, of the slip, because if um, you're somebody that might get caught up in like, are you registered or you're not registered, um, it might be problematic. So um, I always recommend, you know, putting it in your organization thing if you are a member of something, but not saying that you represent them. But I don't think anybody's ever really going to get caught for that. I just, it's as, as legalized, that's where I, I advise you. So um, David is going to tell you how to file a witness slip. Yes, as Jen said, this is the a pretty recent development on ILGA is this ILGA dashboard. And even as recently as a few years ago, if you wanted to file a witness slip, it was a little bit more of a tedious process and this GA dashboard has made it um, pretty accessible. And there's good and bad of that, as Jen just said, with the sometimes overwhelming number of, um, of folks logging on and filing witness slips. We would suggest that you create a login for the ILGA dashboard. And part of that is you can look up you, all of your previous witness slips. It keeps track of them. And you can also go in if you, and it happens to the best of us, mess one up and accidentally put in that you are a proponent of a bill and you meant to be a proponent of just an amendment. So you can and so you can create a login and that will keep track of, uh, of all of your witness slips. This front page will also show you all of today's committee hearings and we'll walk through how to go through the, those committee hearings and, and file witness slips on those in the next slide. So you can find the committee where your bill will be heard. I think this one is set up to look at my truck act. I think it's gonna be heard in that transportation committee. And so you can click on the details of the hearing on the right hand side there. And we'll move on to the next. 
And there you choose your committee. Oh, I guess it's, we're going to environment committee. So you would click on that little piece of paper and that would give you the details. And then this is what shows up. You will see all of the items that are posted for a hearing. So that day there were six measures that were to be heard in committee. And we wanted to fill out one on our milkweed bill so that you would click on you can either view with the, the little magnifying glasses to look at all of the other people who have filed witness slips, or you can create a witness slip using the little piece of paper and pencil there. If you log in, a lot of this will be pre-filled out for you, but this gives you the option of putting in your name, et cetera. And as Jen said, if you are, not authorized to represent an organization, there's a place for representation and normally you should just put self unless you are a lobbyist or authorized to represent uh, an organization for the purposes of lobbying restrictions. It's probably in the best interest of the organization for you to just put self. And I wanna add for the part where you register and sign on, um, I would definitely recommend that you register because one of the other things is if you make a mistake, like you put oppose instead of support or neutral or something, David's going to go into that. But if you make a mistake, you can correct it. If you've registered, you can log back on and you can readjust the slip. But if you haven't registered, you can't fix it. And um, you have, you'll have to call up um, like a staff member to be able to change it. Uh, so that can be really problematic. So always, always register but I'll let David go into this. Yeah, so uh, Cynthia, Cynthia asked, um, if there are too many slips and they're not read, does that make that them obsolete? And I would say no, you know, legislators can still read it on their personal devices. They all have little iPads provided by the Senate or House. And then, yes, if you have, if you're sending this out, you know, our legal, although we are not your lawyers, if we're giving you legal advice here, if you are ever sending out a um, witness slip thing to a bunch of people, we would recommend you put self in the representation form or NA um, and have them put under firm business or agency like that they're with your organization as a member. Um, because in most of the time, this is not gonna be the case, but if you ever have somebody who is um, doing more than $500 of work for your organization and somebody decides to tattle on them as not being registered, um, that could be problematic. It, it's never happened, but that's just advice we want to give you. So, sorry. And I, I think for the, uh, in the interest of, you know, Jen and I are both registered to lobby and represent our organization to legislate, our organizations to legislators in Springfield. And people there know us as the representatives of our organizations. If I were to ask other people at ELPC, hey, this is an ELPC initiative, unless they were going down there to testify, I wouldn't probably ask them to say that they were representing ELPC because it might just get confusing if people look at it and say, who are all these ELPCers? I thought that was Dave. So I might just ask them to, um, to do self if we were doing kind of a, a show of force with these witness slips. And I think we're on to the next one. And here is where I was suggesting that I may or may not have screwed one of these up before. You can either pick the original bill or you can pick amendments and you then select your position on either the original bill or the amendment. And so sometimes it is, you could be opposed to the original bill, but then an amendment brings you to neutral because it fixes the problem that you that you sought. So there it, it would be good to to show that you are neutral or opposed or not opposed on an amendment versus on the original bill. So you can select original bill and then you can, there's a drop down menu that gives you the other amendments in the committee. And then under that, you can see testimony. You could either file a written statement or give oral testimony in the committee. And normally that is worked out ahead of time with the committee who is going to be uh, giving oral testimony. A lot of times we'll just put record of appearance only. And if you're in the room, you might be called up to testify, but uh, generally 
not. Uh, but normally we just do record of appearance only unless we plan to speak. I think if you are logged in, you don't have to go through the robot CAPTCHA thing down here. So that's another benefit. And the written testimony part, when you want to file a written statement, there's also like, it's not easy. Like there's not a like, here's an email or here's where I attach my statement to the witness slip that doesn't exist, which is really unfortunate. So if you do want to file a written witness slip, um, you should know, like, if you're just like a person out there, you know, you can find, well, if you're a lobbyist, you figure out who the committee staff person is and you email them your written statement. Um, if you're not a lobbyist, um, what I would suggest is calling up the Springfield staff person of the committee chair and asking how you can file a written statement and they can connect you to that staffer so you can send that email. So that's how I would recommend doing it, but it is very difficult. And if you're in person, you can like just drop off 18 copies of a written statement and the staffer will actually go around and pass them out. But it is, it is problematic. Like it is something that only really lobbyists can access. And so it's something that we work hard on making sure that individuals can do as well. And it is also once you have, um, once you, once you have submitted that testimony, I, in most cases, it doesn't show up online anywhere. It's mostly just given to the senators or representatives, put into a file, and then it is kept on file with the, uh, the office of the clerk, uh, I believe, but there's not like an online record of your having submitted that written statement or what it says. So it's not necessarily a public record. So Nicole asked, and actually like maybe David can answer this. I, I think the case is no, but do committee chairs have subpoena powers? Can they make you come and testify? I mean, I will say like the testimony, like you don't have to swear on anything. Like you don't have to swear you're telling the truth. I am not sure. I don't, I don't, I don't think so, I think but I'm, I'm not sure. I think most they don't, but like, you know, I do remember with like the House ComEd hearings that they did end up with some power to be able to um, compel records to be filed. Um, so that has happened, but I don't, I don't think a normal committee chair has actual legal subpoena power. So we're gonna look that up. Yeah, and uh, another question in here was about whether or not if the governor does not sign a bill, does it become law after 60 days? Yes, that is the case. It, it, it does not get vetoed, so the governor has to either sign or veto a law, otherwise it becomes law after 60 yeah, days. I've, I've never seen that happen before in like 10 years. I've never seen a governor just like let it go and like just become law, so. All right, so now I'm gonna give you some tips on testifying in committee if you are ever asked to do so. I actually should have put in a different picture here. Testimony is very different nowadays um, with the advent of uh, what has been happening with COVID. Um, on the left here, you can see myself, Cindy Skruker, Jack Darren, Jason Anselman from the Park Districts, um, who I think this is a DNR committee hearing testimony, to be honest. Um, and then over to the right, um, this is uh, Nicole Virgil, who is testifying with Senator Tom Cullerton about a concern that she's having with her garden in Elmhurst. Um, that we did a bill with her on the right to garden. And so this is all about testifying in committee. So, you know, if you are somebody who is an advocate or an expert, you may someday be asked to testify in committee. And I wanna give you a few tips. Um, first off, you do not need to be a registered lobbyist to testify in committee and offer expertise. There is a special exemption in the rules if you are testifying in a committee. But here are some tips that I wanna give you. So first, you'll prepare your testimony. So you're going to keep it short, ridiculously short, um, because there are often times where um, you'll be cut off. You may just have three minutes. And especially now with the online testimony, they can really just be like, that was three minutes. Thanks. Your microphone's cut off. Um, and so with that being said, you want to keep it short. Um, and a lot of you, if you have been to law school, one of the things that they tell you in law school is to put your points up front. So that's one of the things that I want to advise you as well, is if you have three or four points, don't just like save one for the end, do point one, point two, point three, point four, um, right up front, and then go and elaborate all of those different points. 
Um, so, uh, you know, keep it short, do your points up front, et cetera. The other thing is often committees are canceled or testimony is not allowed, so don't be disappointed. Um, some of the ways that we as lobbyists figure out whether a bill is going to be called is that we may go talk to the committee chair beforehand. If it's a bill that we're helping Shepard get through the General Assembly, we usually have a good idea of whether it's being called or not because the sponsor will work with us on whether it's happening. So talking to different advocates, just because it's on the schedule does not mean that it'll be called that day. And just because it's on this, and, and in fact, there's like a high likelihood it's not going to be called, even though it's not on the schedule, even if though it's on the schedule. Um, and uh, often committees are canceled. Even if you have driven three hours from Chicago to Springfield to testify, the committee may be canceled or it may be moved later. Um, I have spent, um, I probably spent like, like a year of my life just waiting for a committee to be called. Like I have wasted a lot of time, um, sometimes hours. So just, you know, keep that in mind if you're somebody who's been asked to come in committee. Um, and then the last, uh, and then you do want to file a slip that says you are there for oral testimony. Um, and like I said, they, they don't, even if you filed oral, they don't have to like allow you to testify because sometimes there'll be like a lot of opponents or a lot of proponents that want to testify and they'll just minimize it to a couple that can make arguments on behalf of the whole team. So you do. But like sometimes I'll be in a committee hearing and just like, you know, random Jane from, you know, Root House, Illinois, just is given a chance to testify because they had time and she was there today. So um, that's that's the thing to think about. But also make sure that you have enough votes. Um, I definitely like really embarrassingly enough, I think this was only like four or five years ago. And so like I'd been doing this for a while and I had a bill in committee that I was like, convinced needed nine votes and it really needed 10. Um, and that was really problematic and it, it got called, it had nine votes and they're like, oh yeah, this can't advance out of committee. So then it stays in committee. So that's just a thing to think about as well. I also wanna to talk to you about lobbying and I am not your lawyer, just remember that. Um, and I, I do have some concerns just about the way that lobbying laws are written in general and the way that they impact nonprofits. But I wanna to talk to you about um, how this could impact you. If you're with a nonprofit organization, you are allowed to lobby um, as part of that nonprofit organization, even if you are a 501c3 tax deductible organization. IEC has a 501c4, which allows us to do 100% lobbying, but you can't deduct that portion. We have a 501c3 you can deduct from, we do no lobbying there. All of our lobbying is done out of our 501c4, um, and, but you can't deduct things that are given to our 501c4. If you're a 501c3, if you're spending less than 5% of your organization's resources or activities on lobbying, you meet the insubstantial part test, there's nothing that you have to do. If you are spending more than 5% of lobbying, um, of your resources on lobbying, you will have to file what's called an H election on your 990s um, and state how much money you've spent in that category. You are only allowed with the 501H election to do 20% overall lobbying, of which only 25% can be grassroots lobbying. Um, and these are uh, two things that are, um, are uh, explicitly defined by the IRS in the, in the Internal Revenue Code. Um, and a direct lobbying is any, commution, any communication with the legislator that expresses a specific view about legislation. Grassroots lobbying is a communication with the general public that expresses a view about a specific issue and includes a call to action. So you'll note with each of these, there is a three-part test for what constitutes lobbying. Um, and so that one includes a specific piece of legislation, um, a call to action, um, and that it needs to be uh, directed towards that, uh, and like uh, directed towards that lawmaker. So I'm gonna go into that over here. Um, no, actually it's the next one. But um, this is uh, the definition of lobbying or of influencing in the state legislature. And I will say like, it is a much broader definition as the state level than it is um, at the IRS level. And also it's much broader at the city level than it is at the state level. So lobby or lobbying means, oh, sorry, any communication with an official for the executive or legislative branch of state government um, for the ultimate purposes of influencing any executive legislative or administrative action, that's the state definition. And influencing is basically anything that is meant to um, uh, promote goodwill or, or cause these other actions um, with respect uh, to lawmakers. 
So, you know, there is a much broader definition there. I have not, you know, like seen people caught for like, you know, just doing an education thing or any other type of goodwill to a lawmaker. Um, but the influencing definition is broad. So this is um, the Lobbying Disclosure Act at the federal government. Um, and this talks about um, lobbying at the federal level, which is a different definition. So uh, there's also um, uh, influencing legislation that is defined with the federal government as well. Um, and it is a similar definition, although actually is more narrow than what is at the state level. So just to do those. Um, and I just want to talk to you about building relationships with elected officials. We talked about this a little bit in our advocacy workshop, um, but we really recommend building relationships with elected officials in advance, and there are several reasons to do so. Um, you may want to have awareness. The elected officials should be aware of your um, organization, their interests and work and your mission. Um, elected officials got into office by having strong relationships. So they may have strong networks to help plug you in. Credibility can help to build your organization, build trust in your organization if they attend an event or support you. Uh, problem solving, you know, one of the things that I recommend for anybody is you want to build relationships before you ever have to ask for anything. Um, you may have a problem someday, and if somebody knows who you are, they're going to be more likely to jump in and want to help you. Um, access, you can become a trusted source of information for decision makers. One of my favorite things is when I call up a senator and they're like, I don't know if I can vote for that. I got to call my community activist, Barbara, to make sure she's cool with it. Of course, Barbara is a Sierra Club member and Barbara is totally on board with my agenda. But I like having people grounded by grassroots supporters in their district because it's way more meaningful than me, the lobbyist, being like, hey, support this thing. Um, if they are being influenced by home, that's a real good sign. Um, and then funding. So maybe someday we won't have a financial crisis. It's probably going to be far off, but there might be ability to have access to funding opportunities. There's also a lot of non-lobbying work you can do with your elected officials. You can add them to your newsletter distribution list. You can invite them to attend to events. You can attend their events. You can invite them on a tour or site-specific visit with your, with your staff. Or give them district-specific info on the issue that you want to work on. None of this is lobbying. It is educational in nature. Um, and so this helps illustrate more that test. Um, and this is specific, uh, uh, I think it's the Boulder Advocacy. If you Google any of this online, there are some great resources that are out there. Um, but communications that are lo not lobbying. An educational communication about an issue that does not mention a specific piece of legislation is not lobbying. Um, and so if you just write about how bobcat hunting is horrible, um, that is totally fine. But also a communication to the general public about a specific piece of legislation that does not express a call to action, also fine. So your educational communication can say something about, you know, like you ought to write your lawmakers about the issue of bobcat hunting. But if you never mention that there's a bill or a specific thing in place, it's not lobbying under the IRS test. Um, but if the communication to the general public, if you um, write a piece that is about like, you know, HB 165 is not a good bill um, and this is why there are concerns with it, but you never tell people to take action on it, still not lobbying. Um, that is not meeting the three-part test. So, um, and, but I will put that foundations really fund lobbying activities. You're getting education funding. You got to keep it to really educating lawmakers or educating the general public, which is fully fundable. Um, should you register as a lobbyist is important. And there are more and more um, registrations at different levels of government that are really concerning to me. Um, MWRD just added one that added uh, an expense that I'm really concerned about. Um, so should you register as a lobbyist? No, you don't have to if you're coming on a specific lobby day. You also don't have to if you are per part of a person or entity that receives no compensation other than reimbursement for expenses of up to $500 a year. So if you're only getting $500 paid and that's how much time you're taking, you do not have to register. And then, um, yes, you do have to register uh, if you're not meeting some of these or the other exemptions. Uh, and it's $300 per organization and per individual each year. Um, there is no lower fee for nonprofits. It is expensive. Um, I think it's really concerning to me for community organizations. So that's should you register as lobbyist. <laughs> 
And I have this picture of the old IEC office. If you're ever in Springfield, stop by the new IEC office at 520 East Capitol. Um, come by, we'll help you with printing Wi-Fi, relaxing and snack needs, comfy shoes. Of course, right now that seems really far off because we have not been there for a year. Um, and I will say, you know, they have not fully extended remote participation in the General Assembly, but they are very much expected to, especially for committee votes and that sort of items. I don't know that they'll do that um, for the entire process, and I don't know if it'll just be emergency in nature, but I do see um, remote uh, participation being much more important in the future. Um, you know, I had to go down to testify to the Senate about a lead bill during lame duck session. Um, and, you know, they had a lot of precautions in place. There were very few legislators in the state capitol at the time that I went. Um, but just a lot of concern there. And, and lobbyists are only allowed into one portion of the Bank of Springfield Convention Center where they don't have any access to lawmakers. Um, so it is really uh, uh, tough. Um, so I think most of this will be done virtually. Um, we do not have a lobby day scheduled this year, but I do think it's going to be virtual again. So you should follow us if you want to get dates to go to virtual lobby day. We just had one um, in November. It was awesome. We had a thousand people registered and had something like 81 different lawmaker visits all in a couple of days, which is fantastic. Um, but we don't know what will happen. So uh, here is the email for myself and David McGillis. This is lobby day past. Um, really, really miss this, really miss all of you. This is one of the last times I was in the Capitol. Um, but I think right now I am going to stop sharing. Um, I'm going to, I'll, I'll uh, put the, um, I think I did put this in here, but please make sure if you are an attorney that you put in the ARDC number so that you can get access to CLE. Um, but we are happy to take any questions at all that you may have at this time. We can describe things more in depth. We can um, give you a little more info. We can just tell you some stories. So um, please put your questions in the chat. Matt just added- Jen, I think there was one that we did not address thus Ooh. far. And it was, if a bill skips committee, does it get still get read three times? And the answer is yes. The, the, that um, three separate readings is a constitutional requirement. Uh, regardless of if it skips committee. Yeah, that is one, the three. Yes, so the access to the presentation to Dominique had asked if you can have access and yes, we will have this on YouTube. Um, so, oops, um, this will be available on YouTube um, and we will figure out a way to share the slides. Um, so you can watch this as many times as you would like and pick up all the information. Um, so, Thank you for thank you for the folks that have stuck with us so far through this. I know this is a long one, but we wanted to provide enough time to provide all the specific details to folks. Um, does anybody else um, have any questions that they want to ask about any part of the process? I'm going to stop and, and have a drink for a second so you guys can think about it. Hmm. Are there any parts of this process of passing a bill that can be cut out that purely is about prolonging the process. Hmm. You want to start with that one, David? Oh, and then I got a joint hmm. message about vehicle bills. So we'll go over that in a second. Yes. Yeah. Um, the guy that's saying direct message. Um, parts of the process that can be passed over. I think, I think that the shell bill and vehicle bill process does cut a lot of, it cuts out a lot of days. Uh, it doesn't necessarily cut out the process of negotiating a bill because it, in our experience, we don't pass a lot of bills that fly under the radar. Uh, there are a lot of things that, um, that make industry mad or agriculture interests or others where they have a loud voice in Springfield. So it's not like we are often the ones kind of us cutting corners in the process. But yeah, I'm, I'm not sure if, of any others that are about prolonging the process. I think the three days issue and also the six day posting period for a bill in committee, those are um, about public notice and not necessarily about prolonging the process. 
Yeah. And I would just say like, you know, like if, if Bill just like isn't getting called, for example, a lot of the times it's because it doesn't have enough votes. And so I will say like one of the things we haven't talked about is there's sort of a cultural thing that like if a bill is called and it doesn't have enough votes, it's very unlikely to be called again. There are some times where I have seen a bill like actually bobcat hunting. There was one day in 2016 where um, Pepper brought the bill for a vote. He only had like 58 votes. He needed 60. Um, like a couple hours later, he called it again. He had 60 because there were some people leaned on. Um, and so, um, yeah, like, uh, but, but that rarely happens. It's just a consideration yeah. that if a bill fails, it, it probably is going to be some time before it comes back. Yeah, it is a uh, measure twice, cut once question of, of running a bill. Um, vehicle bills, you want to do? Yeah, and I guess the vehicle bill is, in in short, it is just a shell bill that has been, that used to be something else. Mm -hmm. um, and so it is the right title to be used for a, a different purpose. Um, and it is in the right position in, and in that it has moved out of one chamber. And so when you're getting into May and you're running out of days, a lot of, or when you're in the second year of a general assembly, you have more bills that are just in a second chamber and can be used for other purposes because they're in the right position in the process, timing wise. Yeah, and I would say both shell bills and vehicle bills, in order to be able to use them, you pretty much need support from leadership to do it. Um, it, it can be used on like a controversial bill, but like there needs to be like some support that's out there for allowing you to have access to this thing. And, and it's only done to meet that constitutional requirement and the deadline requirements that, that need to be put out there. And so, um, you know, it is, there's a little, little iffiness to it, but I have also seen it used for good. Um, and then, you know, like you said with the shell bell, it's just Shell bill is pure, like there are tons of shell bills introduced right now. You go look and the word and is underlined and then crossed off. Um, that is shell bell or the word the. That's usually, I've never seen anything that a shell bill that wasn't the or and. Um, it's usually for shell bills. Um, although I have seen some bills that like are maybe kind of placeholder bills where like maybe you'll write like a little task force, but like eventually you want to do something big. And so you put that in as a placeholder. But vehicle bills are just like using somebody else's bill for a different purpose. So Susan had asked, are representative senators meeting by Zoom this session or are they meeting at the Capitol? So they have not met since January 14th. And January 13th was the swearing in of the new General Assembly. Um, they did meet in the convention center in the Capitol. Um, the House is expected to go back in person February 10th. Um, so they have been meeting in person um because there are some requirements to do so and there will be need to be a law passed there's also a little bit where there's sort of like a constitutional requirement of being in person for um like some of the floor votes um so it's not like the state of wisconsin where we can room raider everybody's zoom backgrounds um but i my expectation is that a lot of the committee votes will be done um by a, a, a web and that the um, floor action will still end up being in person, but I could be wrong. Um, and I kind of hope that this doesn't extend forever because, uh, I mean, obviously the pandemic, but, but the online stuff can be really hard to access and talk to a lawmaker before taking a vote. It's hard to hold them accountable. It's hard for them to see how many constituents support something. <clears throat> so I kind of hope that uh, we are not doing Zoom forever, but I do see I do see the video conferencing being a big part of this session. Do you want to add anything, David? Um, no, I was look, looking for the other, <laughs> for one of the other answers here, actually. Oh, yeah, that, do you have any projections for how it's going to go in the Senate with the new rules allowing a bill to be sent to more than one committee? I mean, like, I think I'm, I'm nervous about that so much. I cannot even tell you because I work with colleagues in California so this is Rachel has brought up the new Senate rules adopted on January 13th when the Senate was sworn in. And some of those included the rule that you can go to more than one committee. And so in California, 
like you kind of know like when it gets assigned it'll be like it needs to go to the environment committee it needs to go to the climate change committee it needs to go to the transportation committee and it might need to go to the three committees before it goes to the floor for a vote um the senate has new rules that allow it to do that and it definitely makes me nervous because you know it could provide a scenario where a bill can go to a committee and then it has to go to another one um so you know i i think it definitely is a tool that could be used to kill more bills which is good or bad um but it definitely makes things harder and especially since we don't know how it'll be done and there's not like a way to predict like if it's gotten out of one committee does it need to have met committee deadline before it goes to the second committee i don't know the answer to that um but i am i am concerned <laughs> about moving things forward um what do you think david i agree I, and i think it remains to be seen how often it is used and um if it, <laughs> it it just it really could slow things down as jen said and i hope that it's not overused and it's just for some uh some issues that actually overlap different committees but i think that there's other ways to deal with that and yeah it, it doesn't seem like a, i don't like it to begin with but we'll <laughs> yeah see. i'm worried um the, the question about actually the question I was looking up was about amendatory vetoes. The governor does have the authority to do an amendatory veto. It is rarely they're often overridden or not accepted uh, from in my experience the that especially if it is if the legislature views them as an attempt to rewrite a bill that had already been negotiated, they'll view it as overstepping and then uh, they will override those amendatory vetoes or not take them up and they don't become law. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So cool. Um, we're almost at time here, but does anybody else have questions that they would like to ask? We're happy to take anything that you'd like. Um, thanks for sticking with us through all of this. Jen, do you have you have email addresses for the slides was one of the questions prior. Yeah, I assume. and I think that often we put the slides as a link in the YouTube. Got it. Um, so but we will have um, we will have the YouTube uh, YouTube link available and um, Matt, Matt put in the YouTube link for our advocacy 101 that describes just a little bit of contacting lawmakers, which is definitely its own thing. Um, so I have a question. Yeah, go ahead, Nicole. Yes. Um, now, there's no guarantee that a committee will be called on the day uh, that it is, you know, quote unquote, scheduled to uh, be called. Or, or there's there's no guarantee a bill will be called on the uh, on the day that it's scheduled to be called in committee. So, what you know, how do you tell these? Um, these groups that are coming down from various parts of the state who want to testify and they get down there and then, you know, the bill or, or the committee has been canceled and they do this several times. How, I mean, how do you, how do you even uh, reconcile that? No, I mean, I think it's awful and it's awful that especially um, community activists are treated like that. I mean, I definitely would recommend that community members really um, work with advocates on it because we usually do have a little bit of information, but especially like if we're, I know like a couple years ago, we opposed that bill about pipeline protest and um, that particular bill was like scheduled for committee like three times before it was heard. So like all of these activists came down three different times. Um, you know, like I, I think that's really hard and it's a really hard way to treat people. I know that if somebody has come from far away, like they've flown in or that sort of thing, um, often there is a lot of sympathy from the committee chair to like hear that person's testimony if they can never come back. Um, but you know, that generally is applied to um, like expensive experts or, you know, professional lobbyists. It's not applied to like, you know, um, I just like just keep using Joe that came from Root House. I just I like like the town of Root House. Um, so like um, you know if if you although that's really not that far from Springfield, so they could come back. I suppose there is a, a sometimes a silver lining in that if if folks have made the trip down, at least they can do an active lobby during that day and you know talk to um, talk to legislators about the issue and 
treating it as if they are going to be testifying in committee, you can get FaceTime with the legislators who are on that committee maybe and, and present the issue. But yeah, that's, it is difficult. And, and it's also, I think, good to have a realistic expectations that of the possibility of your bill. And that's why Jen said the important, most important thing is knowing what 50 plus one is in a committee. Yeah, yeah. But I, I do, like I said, I do think there is some sympathy for people who have traveled from far away um, by committee chairs. And like, sometimes they'll just do what's called a subject matter hearing where they don't take a vote if somebody's traveled from far away. But uh, it is one of the many ways that Springfield is a very hard place for just average people that um, are not insiders to access. And I, I really think that's a concern. And that's why we do this because you know, you deserve access to your government. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Nicole. Great. Any other questions anybody has? We're taking them all. Okay. I think that's really it. And make sure to put your um, CLE number into the spot for the CLE so we will get you um, the credit that you've earned um, if you are an attorney. Um, Matt's putting that link in, but we will also share this information on YouTube later. And um, David and I really are here to help answer any questions you may have about this whole process. Um, like I said, it is designed not for the public to access, and we just want to open those doors wide and let everybody in. So thank you all for your participation. Um, we really appreciate uh, your having attended today. I know we'll have um, some lunch and learns at various times throughout the rest of the year. So I hope you will join us for some of those um, and give us some ideas of things you'd like to hear. So thanks again for joining um, and um, feel free to contact us at any time. So thanks and have a great day. Thanks a lot. Thanks,